Apples. Hey, Don. Hey, apples. Apples. <coughs> okay. All right, tape rolling. Uh, I'm not going to do the normal intro. I'm going to do the yeah. intro later on. Okay, so that's gonna, great. Uh, Neil, let's like, I'd like to start with uh, your new album, Time Fades Away, um, which you recorded live in the last tour. And you were riffing with me before we sat down in the you know, studio to talk about you know, this whole thing, that you had done an, your album in a, in a different way. Would you like to describe that for me? I'd appreciate that. You mean technically? Technically, or? that new kind of a thing that you came up with. Uh, well, we just, uh, what we did is we eliminated the, uh, tape copy, um, the generation of, uh, you know, like a two-track master, we didn't use one. We went directly from the 16-track to the disc through a computer. And the computer, in other words, uh, instead of, uh, the computer was set up, as I recall, to, um, make everything, um, possible for helping you to mix down so you could r remember all the different tracks that you yeah. use, right? Computer, what the computer does is instead of you making a mix of the record that they usually use as a master, mm -hmm. you know, like you move all the faders and make it sound the way you want it to sound, mm -hmm. uh, it was, um, it remembers all that stuff so you don't have to make a copy of it anymore to, to know that you got it. I mean, that's the principle is that instead of making a copy, to capture what you did. Mm -hmm. This thing remembers what you did, and then you can use your original master, the 16 track, connect this thing to it, and connect right the other end of that to the disc maker, and then you just run it, and it goes right off to the 16 track, right onto the disc, which brings all the people who buy a record one step closer to the real sound. You know, in other words, you serve, uh, save a generation. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, you're into... Um, I doubt if this album will save a generation. Though. The time fades away. <laughs> okay. All right. The generation... <laughs> hey, pretty fast. <laughs> All right. <laughs> that generation was lost, right. <laughs> Sorry about that. It was a potentially a funny line. <laughs> okay, so you, you, did you like it as a, as a good representation of your live performance? Definitely. I think, it's a, I think it's really an accurate representation of where that tour was at mm. and the kind of thing I was trying to do on it and where my head was at when I was out there. By the time uh, people are listening to this uh, show, uh, you might have another album out at the same time, which would be released, what, six weeks after the first if it goes down, right? Well, if it, it, you know, it's, it's not a definite thing that it'll come out that fast. It's finished right now, and I feel very strongly that it should come out as soon as it's ready, you know, mm. rather than waiting for uh, other reasons. But uh, I can't guarantee it'll be out for six weeks. In, in six weeks from, from when now time or from when Time Fades okay. Away comes out. But it is ready, and it'll be coming out as soon as mm -hmm. we can get it out. And that's called Tonight's Tonight. Yeah. Right. Okay, let's go on to other things. Um, are you satisfied with the songs that uh, you're writing today, such as uh, out of the uh, Journey Through the Past or Love and Mind or Don't Be Denied and Lost Last Dance? You happy with the things that you're doing now, as you were, like, last year or a year or so back or two years or three? Uh... Well, I tell you, it's uh, it's kind of hard to uh, to say whether I'm happy with them or not. Some of them really say where uh, how I feel, you know, and then some of them are my my viewpoints on other things, you know, that aren't don't personally connect to me, you know, too directly, you know. They aren't some of the songs aren't super personal, and uh, some of some of them are. So it's hard for me to say whether whether I feel satisfied with them or not. It's, I, the vibe of when I was doing them and when I when I wrote them and when I recorded them is uh, you know I was moving real fast at the time and uh, so seeing a lot of people and everything and I, I sort of more remember that you see the I remember more of the experience of making the album and everything that surrounded it more than I do the actual performances of the songs on the on the record so I done I what I'm trying to say is that I don't have an objective viewpoint on this particular record like I do on some of my others because it reminds me so much of the tour and the speed that we were going out and the number of people that I had to confront every night or that, uh, you know, that it just, you know, mm. it's, you know, it puts my head in a different place. A different place. Yeah, well, other than where the music was. Is there something else that you'd like to be doing in music, uh, uh, say, from this moment as we're sitting here uh, or maybe in your personal life? Is there something other direction? I know about film, but... Maybe expand upon you know expand upon that a little bit. Uh, right now I'm you know uh, let's see. Well, I just finished tonight's the night, mm -hmm. this other album. That was just like a sort of it was an explosion. I don't mm -hmm. know how that happened, but I think that uh, you know I feel very happy with that musically. I feel really good about where I am right now, and uh, 
the film, you know, I hope that I hope that turns into something for me because it. Uh, I definitely, you know, I think you need something else other than than. Uh, you can't do the same thing all the time, you know. Just make records. Yay. Yeah. Are you as uh, politically uh, motivated as you were in maybe in the early part of uh, your career? I mean, can you separate politics from you as an artist? Uh, yeah, yeah. Before I, I at the first part of my uh, career or whatever, that I, I, uh, I wasn't really into politics, you know. And then all of a sudden, uh, I just sort of got into it because of what was going on around me. Yeah. I, I couldn't ignore it, you know. It was just too obvious to me. So I started thinking about that for a while, and then I got into that and really heavily got into that. And now I think I've come out of the other end of that awareness. I mean, I'm not as aware as of that. I feel like most people are, that, like most people feel that with the ending of the war, uh, per se, whatever that means, and the, uh, and, um, the w Watergate yeah. trip and this, this whole thing, you know, and that that we are, you know, in a different era now than we were then, you know. I I think politics plays a different part in this era than it did in the last, in the era, say, of the revolution and the... I'm not saying that... Uh, I guess I am saying that the revolution, like, uh, of the 60s is no definitely than, not with us anymore. The revolution of the 60s is no longer the revolution of... Uh, it's just the different now. I, I'm not, like, uh, as politically oriented as I was, I don't think, because, I, you know, it, it, it doesn't uh, get my heart, you know, what's going on now. It's just, you know, I don't know what, it just doesn't, you know, like when, it's, there's nothing happening that would spark a song for me gotcha. right now. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of heavy things going down, but I'm thinking about something else, you know. There haven't been four students killed or eight students killed yeah. somewhere else. That kind of thing isn't happening. We've sort of changed, or maybe, I don't know. Well, <laughs> I will, I'll, then I'll jump away then, if we've changed. Uh, before we went on the air, we were riffing about the fact that uh, the birds and the, and, the, and the Springfield were latter day, um, latter 60s, I should say, latter uh, 60s that carried over into the 70s, and we're just beginning our 70s now. Isn't that correct? Yeah, I think music. so. In so far as music, I think the last couple of years have just been, uh, uh, you know, late in the 60s, just mm -hmm. things, you know, over overhanging and everything. And I feel now that, uh, you know, that, that the change into the music of the 70s is starting to come, you know, with uh, people like David Bowie and Lou Reed, people like that are really starting to come into their own as writers and as performers now, and, uh, you know, I think there's some really good things there. What do you think of Alice Cooper? Uh, I kind of like Alice Cooper. I think that's pretty far out. I think it's a, I think it's a whole other, it's a whole other trip, you know, and I, I enjoy it. It's part theater and, 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 and everything. I've never seen one of the concerts. I only go by the vibe that they give people and that I've, that I've related to, you know, that I've heard people talking about them and I see their advertisements and I hear their records. I think one was called School is Out Forever yeah, or something. Yeah, School is Out Forever last year. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I kind of like that, you know. Mm. I th it's sort of a sort of a gay abandon sort of thing, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know I what it, it means. You know, I like it. Okay, we'll stop for a minute. Take my dog, Apple. So long, Apple. Have a nice See you later. See you later. See you later. Um, earlier this year, uh, the four of you got together again. I mean, I'm actually putting the cart before the horse, but the four of you got together in, in July, Crosby, uh, Stills, Nash, and you. And uh, as I understand it, you rehearsed a lot, but never put anything down. Maybe you did some, put some things down on tracks. Did you? Yeah, we recorded a little at my we recorded a little bit at my ranch. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we we played a lot and we got uh, you know we got back together again musically, you which did. was really nice. Uh, when we you know when we laid off for a while, we worked at it for quite a while, and then we laid off and to all do our own things again. And we actually didn't produce anything that uh, during that time that we were working together that uh, anyone will probably ever hear. Although we did, uh, we did, well, we learned some songs, and uh, we didn't make any finished records or anything during that time, though. We learned a lot of songs, and we learned about each other, a little more about where we're at now, because we haven't seen each other really in a couple of years, except, you know, talked on the phone and just keeping in touch, making sure every, everything's cool and everybody's all right, you know. Where are you, Visa, uh, uh, in reference to the guys? Where are they in reference to you? In other words, when you say you touch base, Finally, after a couple of years, um, the uh, question I'm about to ask is: 
Oh, hold a minute. Okay. okay. Mm. Stop tape for a minute, please, and start it when I tell you to. Sorry about you. That's all right. All right. Well, they can make it quite fast. What? They they can quite fast. I mean, so. Oh, you don't know our techniques. Oh. No problems at all. We go. <laughs> and it's blight. <laughs> First time I've ever seen that. The first time I ever saw one said he showed up me this morning at the house. It was interesting. A surprise as hell. It's a nice shot. You should see the cover itself. This is much smaller. Do, do you have artistic control in your album cover? Yeah. You do? Yeah. 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 You and every you and Joni was the first one I ever knew that had artistic <coughs> control. Yeah. yeah. Well you gotta have it. Yeah, I got a question about Jack Me too. If I get to it. We'll get to it. We'll get We're doing to well. We'll cover them all. We'll cover them all, baby. That's right. Uh, Thanks, fellas. Again, my apologies. That's okay. quite all right. Yes, I'm trying to watch. I keep forgetting. Yeah. The, the new one? Uh, well, this is going to be released. The what? Oh, yeah. I'm going to get a release from you. I'll do that. That's cool. Okay. Start tape, please. Um... We had covered the fact that you were, you know, had gotten together. But I wanted to ask a question as a follow-up to that. Uh, how did your joining, um, well, let's see, how different is it now from the first time that you joined David and Stephen and Graham? Um, no, I'll ask that question later. Let me start again. You have four divergent personalities, mm -hmm. yet you clicked. You were the supergroup of all supergroups. Uh, and are the supergroup of all supergroups. I don't think uh, anybody has had the product A or the name B uh, that you had. There was supergroups such as Cream or what have you, or, or no, the one that was started after Cream, um, Blind Space. They, it was an attempt to do the supergroups, people from other, mm -hmm. you know, the homogenizing or the cross-pollination yeah, kind of thing. Yeah, right. But um, the thing, Neil, about uh, you four people was very unique, that you came from, uh, you loved each other a lot. I mean, you, you admired each other's music. I'm actually saying what, I would like to have you say. Yeah, well, it's true. It's true. We, uh, you know, we loved playing together. We had a lot of past together. We all came from, you know, we had a lot of memories of each other, you know, from, from a long time ago, mm -hmm. watching each other grow up and watching each other, you know, really put out music that has blown each other's minds, you know, over a long period of time. And that we have that relating point, you know, we have a relating point from the past. Now, the thing is, uh, is that is that still going relating point still going to be sparkling now like it was then? Is is the I thing see. you know? And so that's the where our that's where our uh, that that's what we got together to find out and to get it to get it going and see what was happening. And when we when we did stop playing, we had reached a point that we all felt you know that we were really together and that we that we could do it, you know. And it it takes a while, you know. You can't just sink into something like that. You can't just turn it on, everybody walk in the room, and, and there it is, you know, because we, we all, you know, we stay away from each other for a while, and we get preconceived ideas of different things, and everybody changes, and everything. you have to learn to meet everyone again, you know. All right, that was July of uh, 1973, and uh, uh, right uh, at the moment of this, uh, as we're taping this show, uh, Graham is uh, on the road with the group that uh, he and David went on the road with, and David's going on the road with that same group, and mm -hmm. Stevens is off with, Stevens off with Manassas. So uh, this is the fall of 1973. Uh, are you committed to delivering an album, uh, say, February of next year? Or no, we have, we have no commitments to do anything, because uh, I think that would make us crazy if we had mm -hmm. to. So we're trying to stay away from having, from, you know, a commitment to do anything, because it seems whenever we have the people expecting us to do something is when we start to get shaky about it, you know, is when we start to uh, get, uh, you, you know, when you start feeling the pressure, I think that's what, uh, you feel the pressure of, everybody thinks it's going to have to be some kind of a great thing, you know, and to get, to get through all of that and get right down to having a good time playing together in the studio and forgetting about who we are and about who everybody thinks we are and about what the album's going to be like and whether we should go this way or whether it should be that way. Forgetting about everything except the basic songs and the feeling behind the songs and still having all four of us in the same room at the same time is, is what we're going to try to do. 
And it takes a while to get that when you're in our positions, it takes a while to get that way together, you know. Well, I hope we can. I sincerely hope we can, because I think it would be great. I heard a singing. In July, we sang. It sounded better to me than it ever has. And I, I certainly hope that we can get it on a record so people can hear it. In other words, uh, that which was uh, joined again in July will uh, conceivably, that, that good feeling will carry over. We certainly hope so. Okay. No reason why it shouldn't, actually. We all really want to do it. Everybody's super into it. I think, uh, you know, we plan to get together in late November or December and start playing again and just feel the vibe and do whatever we feel is right. If we feel like playing before we make a record, you know, maybe we should go out and, and actually see the people as a group of, as a group, go and see the, the people, you know, and get the vibe of, of uh, before we do an album. Maybe we should do that. It's hard to, you see, we really don't know what to do exactly, whether to put out an album first or, or you know. Or go out and, and and feel it out and just see how uh, how things fe how you know how the vibe is and how the the people who are are interested in music are feeling just how things are going and try to put that onto a record you know try to relate to that and put it onto a record possibly just a live thing based upon maybe good vibes yeah it'd be real nice mm -hmm. was it uh, difficult Neil starting uh, your career as a uh, as a solo artist after you left the Springfield. I mean, was it hard getting together, I mean, personally in your head or musically? No, I don't think so. I, I loved it. When I started out playing alone, I really loved it. It was real easy and uh, super simple. I was doing, I guess, in 69 when I started doing to a tour by myself. And it was real easy for me. And then uh, I did another one like that in 70 mm -hmm. or 71. I can't remember. 71, yeah. And... Uh, that was great, too. We did a tour of about 30 places just alone and everything. It felt really good. Being a solo performer or whatever is, uh, it's real easy. If you, if you, you know, if, if you can just feel things and let it out, you know. Then, uh, how did, um, how did you feel about when you, when, uh, all you four people got together? Well, if I asked this question, if I don't know if I did, I, I think I, I sidetracked myself, but I'll go back to it. Um, when, um, it was first Crossing and Stills, uh, Stephen had left the group, had left the Springfield at the time. David had left the Birds. Um, then Graham came over and leaving the Hollies. And then you were the solo person. Mm -hmm. And uh, your divergent managers, who at the moment were not partners at the time, uh, Jeff and Roberts, uh, put you together, or at least, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a mistake. Okay, you guys got it together. And of course, uh, yeah, I think it started with Stephen and Armand talking to each Armand other. Armand of Atlantic? Yeah, about, I think Crosby, Stills, and Nash had finished their album. They were thinking about going out on the road. To, to promote the album, you know, to show people what they were. But, uh, you know, when, when they started thinking about it, they realized that to have me there would be uh, just another ad another addition, I guess, just another step. And they wanted uh, they wanted to do that, you know, to, to uh, carry that Springfield thing that Stephen and I had going over mm -hmm. into their thing, you know, which was a really great vocal sound. And uh, I, guess, uh, I guess that's why they asked me to join, you know. And at that time, I was really excited, you know, because I hadn't been doing, hadn't been doing really well. I had a couple of records out, and neither one were really too successful. It was uh, Neil Young, and everybody knows this is nowhere. Yeah. And that neither neither one of them were doing super good, you know. Then I joined Crosby, Stills and Nash, and did that tour with them, and my records started picking up. You know, everybody knows this is nowhere. Started doing better and better, and hung in there for a really long time. And so I guess it helped me, you know, on all levels joining them. Uh, I, besides making what I thought was really great music that was really getting me off, I mean, uh, more people were getting to know me as an artist and uh, and, and to uh, get interested in what I was doing. So it was, a, it was a really good thing for me. It was a good thing for everybody, I think, because I think I, I added a lot to them, too, as well as them helping me. Very true. Um, could you discuss, Neil, uh, the Springfield in retrospect? I'm going to ask you about four, maybe divergent questions. It's all based upon you to discuss with Springfield, particularly how you felt about the group when you were with it, the original with Richie and and, uh, well, that, that, and Bruce, that crazy, yeah, that crazy, crazy, crazy bunch. Bruce. <laughs> crazy bunch of dudes, right? Well, I tell you, I felt like I was, I felt myself and, and, and the other guys in the group and about maybe 20 or 30 other people <laughs> <laughs> thought that we were fantastic. I mean, we thought that the group had a feeling and we felt real about it. Nobody had ever done it 
before. I mean, other groups had done it, but we had never done it as a group. It was our first try, and we felt like a group. We felt like a unit, and we, uh, we felt that if we'd have gotten, I, I'm sure that if we'd, we'd have gotten any kind of recognition at the beginning for our first two or three albums, I mean, we put all our albums out and everything that's ever been out, plus anything that they're going to put out, is all, all was recorded in two years. And we didn't really get any recognition at that time. If we'd have gotten some, we, 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 you know, we probably would have stayed together because I loved it then. You really believe that? Because, I mean, uh, being on the end as a disc jockey, being on this end, one who plays the finished product that comes out, uh, I remember those exciting days as I was talking about in, in, before the, the show began, about uh, you running up with dubs of the Buffalo Springfield oh, band. Yeah. We were I mean, what, uh, just dubbing and, and coming from the pressing plant and, and bringing me dubs to be the first one to play on yeah, the air. Yeah, I know. And <laughs> it was exciting. And you were, this town, well, Los Angeles, uh, I, I couldn't speak for the rest of the country. I didn't ever watch record sales or anything like that. But it was your town. It was the bird's town. Um, there has been talk for many, many a year that probably the best kind of a nostalgic kind of show that one could put on the Hollywood Bowl would be to put you in the old Springfield, mm -hmm. the old birds, the original, everybody original, yeah. and the original Love and Spoonful from the East Coast, because that, would, that was the, the music of those late 60s. That would be great. Wouldn't that be great in one show at the Bowl? That would be a trip. I'd love well, it. I, I, man, that would be something. Yeah, but that's in the kids. past, you know, that's that in is the past. past. Right. That's that the sort past. of puts us all in a Bill Haley category, you know, know. weird Harry Como. Sign, you know, mm. Art, Art Nouveau. <laughs> Art Nouveau. I said Art. I said Art Nouveau. I did say Art Nouveau. Okay. Art Nouveau. <laughs> <laughs> uh, were you, when you wrote now, nowadays, Clancy, as opposed to uh, what you write now, I mean, did you consider yourself a confident writer? Uh, I didn't have any idea what I was at that time. I was just writing. I wrote the words in a corner and uh, wrote them all down so that they looked. Uh, you know, I'd write 12, 12 lines of poetry and then look at it and I go, wow, what a trip that was. And nowadays, Clancy can't even sing. And then I sat down and wrote the second verse and the third one just, you know, so that they look the same graphically on the paper. You know, it was weird. I, just to get the shape of the paragraph the same, you know. And uh, then I wrote a melody to it. You know. But, uh, you know, I don't write like that anymore. I'm not nearly as analytical as what, I used to be. Was Stephen, as uh, compared to you, a more competent writer then? I think he was uh, definitely more... Uh, um, prolific than I was at that time. He wrote a lot more songs than I did. Uh, he wrote, uh, what was that song? For What It's Worth and everything. That was really a spontaneous thing after the Sunset Strip riots and everything. That was, that was, a, that, that, that was probably the best, the best thing, contribution that Buffalo Springfield made on, on a political level or on a, you know, yeah. contribution, contemporary music contribution to a feeling of a generation or something level. I don't know what I mean by that, really. But I think I know what you mean by it. <laughs> I understand it. Uh, there was a time that he was frightened that he was going to be known as a political writer. I mean, at the time of the For What It's Worth kind of, you know, success. Yeah. Uh, yet, four years later, you wrote a, 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 an activist song of a nature, a politically motivated song of a nature. At 66, and in 70, you write, was it 71? I forgot when Kent State was. You know, and you write Ohio. Um, yet you were not afraid of that kind of connotation being placed in your head. No, I didn't care because I figured by then that people didn't think I was going to do that. So, uh, I don't, you know, I didn't feel that I would be typecasting myself as a, as a, as a political, uh, you know, person. Although I, you know, I don't really care. You know, I just, I, I think that uh, writing that song was just a pure reaction to the, to the cover of Time magazine, which was sitting there. I never really thought about it any picture. other way. picture of Allison, what's her name, sitting there with that dead kid lying on, on the sidewalk. It's kind of a, you know, and, and now all this stuff, you know, which was Segretti and all that, you know, that whole thing that Watergate brought out about the actual people that went to the demonstrations and provoked these scenes to happen, you know, to make the hippies and, and all the people look like a bunch of communists, uh, you know, like make them look like a bunch of radicals, you know, with, uh, that, that would shoot and kill people and everything, trying to smear that whole trip, you know, that revolution trip and make a bad name. That's what those cats were trying to do. And that bugs me. I mean, that still bugs me. I can't forget that, you know. Uh, and that gives me a reason to sing the song again, because I know that there must have been some connection there more than what we know about. 
you know, and the investigation and everything was all ludicrous and the whole thing. It's just like the Kennedy assassination. It's just, you know, we never really found out what went down. No, you know, we didn't. The people who are trying to investigate it are the people who got the whole thing together in the first place, you know. It just doesn't work that way. Um, did you know, uh, were you very tight with David uh, Crosby as a, what, David, uh, when he was a bird? When he, did you guys hang out? Not too him? tight, no. As a matter of fact, we were, we were not the best of friends at that time. Stephen and uh, Stephen and David had uh, were, were were really good friends, and when I quit the Springfield, uh, the first time I quit the Springfield, I could uh, you know both Crosby and Stills and all the other guys in the group thought I was nuts, you know, but I just I couldn't. I, did too. I, I think I was probably, <laughs> <laughs> but I got back on the track a couple of months later. Mm. But uh, around then, David uh, David told me that he thought you know. He didn't have any respect for me because I quit, you know. And uh, I later on, I could dig what he was saying, you know, because he thought the group was really good and everything. And then later on, we got to be really good friends, you know, once we got to know each other, you know. To me, he was always David Crosby of the birds, you know. Like, that was like he was this big thing, you know. And I really took a long time before I could relate to him or Graham as anything else than, you know. And, you know, I mean, I listened to Holly's records for years, you know. It's, to me, it's like, you know, meeting McCartney or Lennon or something like that, you know. I mean, I, I felt the same way about about those guys, as I, you know, because they just really put out, you know. So it took me a while to get over the flash of who they were and really get into meeting them as people, you know. You knew Stephen, uh, and you didn't know Graham. That's interesting. So my next question was going to be, did you know Graham as a holly? No. And, but you just liked his music so far. Yeah. Whew, dynamite. Which of uh, Stephen's songs uh, have impressed you the most? His songs? Uh, let's see now. Let's see now. Which there's so many of them. I got a million albums. Oh, uh, what's that one now? Uh, he has one called. Uh, he has one called Love Story that isn't out yet. It's a really beautiful song. Is it with Manassas? Uh No, he's he's never done it. Oh. It's a great song, though. Beautiful song. And uh, um, I really liked uh, Hung Upside Down. I thought that was a fantastic song. Sit Down, I Think I Love You, I thought it was a great song. And, um, what was that other one he did? Bluebird, that was great. And uh, what was that one? That was oh, uh, what the heck is that song? The one about old times, good times. Um, it's on his first solo his first album. album. Yeah, yeah there's right. some really, you know, he's got and an, he he's done some really great stuff. Black Queen, I like Black Queen. That was great. I mean, you know, all through his whole career, he's had he's had gems that just keep showing up, you know, and uh, you know, sometimes uh, sometimes you don't get to hear them the way I get to hear them. I just get to hear him in the song, you know. So I don't have the same relating point as probably hundreds of thousand people do, you know, because they don't. They buy the records, and the record sometimes doesn't sound like what the song sounded like the first time I hear it. All my there's another song called "Pretty Girl Why," which is really a great song that he did, and a couple of other ones. "My Angel" was an early song, yeah. really early, and you know some beautiful songs that he wrote. Really. Um, David is not as uh, prolific a writer as perhaps you or Stephen or or Graham is. Which of David's songs? He, he writes sad things. Try yeah, everything. everybody has been burned. Oh. Triad, um, uh, laughing, uh, wooden chips. Uh, you know, David's just Guinevere. He's had, he, uh, he's had uh, all along the Lee Shore. He's had so many songs that I that I really like. You know, you just made me think about. He has written more than I thought. He's right? written a lot of songs. Yeah. I, mean, he, I mean, he's a heavy writer. He, d he just doesn't. Uh, Personally, I think he should record his songs quicker because he, he'll get a couple of songs together and then he'll hold on to them for a long time, waiting for the right way to do them. And I think, you know, if anything, that's why he doesn't write more because he doesn't get he doesn't get it out right away, get it down on tape and get it out of his system in order to leave room for something new to come in. And that's probably why we haven't heard more from him, you know, than we have. There's but I still think that er that, that, you know, He's written some of the most feeling songs mm. that I've ever heard. You know, like uh, Almost Cut My Hair was a very crude song, you know, a very crude recording and everything, but it was so real. I mean, if you know Crosby, you can believe that what he's telling you in that song is true. 
You know, that he looks in his mirror and sees a cop and gets paranoid is a reality for Crosby. You know that. You know him. I mean, it, other people listen to that song, they couldn't believe it. They thought it was a little exaggerated, you know, maybe a little obvious. You know, I almost cut my hair. You know, what is that a joke? You know, but the thing is that he lives, you know, at that time he was living that, you know. And that's what I love about David is if he believes it, I mean, you know, he believes what he's saying, so he can't do it. David's organically alive at the yeah. moment. Very, very, very much into the very into the moment itself. A very emotional person, and for sure that he was the uh, the heartbeat and the whole spark of Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young. There's no doubt about that. That Crosby was the one who kept it together, and the one who keeps it together on stage. Although he is probably in many ways the shakiest one of all of us, and and you know, we all you know go through a lot of changes together. But it's his immediate emotion, and and his. Uh, sort of a search for a, for a reality that he can live with at the very time that he's there is, is what really keeps it alive. He's got, a, he's got a sense of theater then. He, has a, he just has a sense of, uh, uh, he just has a sense of emotion. emotion. He just lets it out, you know, whatever it is and whatever extreme it is, you know. Dynamite. Okay, uh, then I, to be perfectly honest, and, and the co co cover it all, I'm going to get around to you in a moment. Which is Graham's song? Do you like them? Oh, God. Let's see. I like Our House, I think, is the best one, I think, of his. So pretty. It's so a great pretty. song. Yeah. You like I Used to Be a King? He's a bleeder. Too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I love I Used to Be a King. He's got the new thing. It's a new song called Sleep Song, which is on his new album, which will be out in about six weeks. Um, he's got some great new songs on that album. Which ones do I like? Yeah, overall continuously and which ones have you rejected maybe huh well they go all the way back you know the the early the early um buffalo springfield stuff i guess i've rejected almost everything from the first album and uh expecting to flies hanging in there as a record for the second from the second album and the third album the song i am a child was pretty nice but i don't think the recording was very good and uh then um, on my first album, I, I liked The Loner. I mm. felt like I was getting into something different there, you know, starting to anyway. Uh, some of the other stuff, The Old Laughing Lady, I think was probably the best record on that. Yes, one of the most know. requested things on my show. Yeah, that that's really a good one. Although we did, some, we did some other things on that that I really got into. That was a personal album. The second, Everybody Knows This Is Nowhere, I don't think there's mm -hmm. anything on it that I didn't like. You do like it all. Yeah, I like it all. Mm -hmm. uh, that's when a change came over me right then. I started trying to just do what I was doing, you know, and just trying to be real instead of fabricate something and show people where my head was at. I just wanted them to know where I was at, you know. And uh, since then, I've just been striving to get it realer and realer on the record, you know, as in more real. <laughs> Um, My English teacher, man, I can't can't shake him. What part of Canada are you from? Uh, Winnipeg. Winnipeg. Yeah. And Joni Mitchell is from where? Saskatoon. S is that nearby? It's uh, it's not far away. About 500, 600 <laughs> miles or something. <laughs> that's Canadian. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, that's interesting. Um, you're a a woods person. You've uh, carried that over. You're a ranch person, and uh, Joni is to a certain extent too. She likes woodsy things. Mm-hmm. Um, she told me one time, or I don't know if it was a part of a riff I heard her do live when she was doing a, the Circle Game, that she wrote it for you. Is that true? Yeah, she wrote it for me. I, I, she heard Sugar Mountain, you know, a long time ago. I wrote Sugar Mountain uh, around the time when I first met Chuck and Joni. Chuck was her old man at the time, and they were doing an act together in folk houses, you know. And uh, <clears throat> I wrote that, I was writing that song at that time, and she really liked it, and uh, so she wrote like a sequel to it, you know, which was a circle game. Mm. Yeah, you yeah. listen to those two tunes back to back. I've done out, it. out at the corral, you should have been at the corral, Joni and I sang uh, Sugar Mountain with, uh, with, a, with an electric band. Joni's into electric guitar now, which is kind of far out, nobody's heard it yet, but she's been jamming with our band and with, uh, Dave, with Graham's band. And uh, she's getting really funky, I think it's going to surprise a lot of people. Yeah, well, she started getting funky in this last album of hers. Yeah, to yeah. To do a side trip. Yeah, yeah. Um, Sweet Fire yeah, and those right. things. But this, that's clean compared to what she's into now. <laughs> <laughs> Can't wait. Does, um, does, um, well, 
we mentioned Joni. Are any other musicians other than yourself, other than the boys, other than Joni, say that interest you, that influence you, or have? I have to say that uh, Lou Reed is probably uh, at this moment. Yeah, I I haven't really. I've only heard one of his albums, and I've heard uh, one of his songs on the air a lot. That one about uh, Walk on the Wild Side. Walk on the Wild Side. I thought it was a very fresh approach. I thought it was uh, a significant, you know, between him and uh, David Bowie and Alice Cooper and and uh, I think that that uh, I mean you know. I think that that is a new direction. There's something theatrical about that that, that wasn't happening in the music of the 60s. And uh, I personally, although I haven't seen any one of those people, you know, I haven't seen any of those people, although I might have met Lou Reed maybe five years ago mm -hmm. in a motel in, on the East Coast. I might have been. He said he used to be in the uh, Velvet Underground. Right. He was in the Velvet Underground. And I can't remember, but... Uh, I really like his record now, the one he made, uh, Walk on the Wild Side, I thought it was really fresh. That that's the freshest thing I've heard recently. That's interesting. That music, of course, I mean, the Velvet Underground was such underground music for so very long. Yeah. And uh, it, at times it used to be called transvestite music, but it's not, actually. And uh, now he, he has sprang, as you say, full grown into the public consciousness. Transvestite music. <laughs> transvestite music. It is called that. Well, maybe it is. You know, maybe it's that and everything else. It's good music. Sure it's it is. The thing. He's telling a story, of uh, street stories, you know, and th that's a reality that we've just been, uh, you know, that's a reality in the 70s. I mean, people, uh, you know, heroin and, uh, and, and the whole way of life that those people are into or some of them are into or speed or whatever they're into. It's a very, uh, compared to the 60s, uh, this is much more of a dope generation that we're in now, only it's, it's uh, almost taken for granted. And that's what the approach that a lot of these people have towards making records is that homosexualism and, and heavy dope use and everything is, is, is a way of life to a lot of people, and they don't expect to live any more than 30 years and don't care. You know, I, I, even, you know, and they don't care. I mean, you know, they're... They're, they're, uh, they're in the 70s, you know. It blows a lot of people's mind that there are people like that, you know. But I can, I mean, uh, I understand it, you know. I'm not uh, that far out myself, but uh, I can certainly dig where they're at. I think it's really a good, I think it's a great reaction to the world, the way the world is now. What these people are doing is, a, it's, an, it's, a, it's an offspring of what we've done to them, you know. And I think it's valid, and I think it's new. I really, it's you know. A, what do you mean by it's an offspring of what they've it's, done? It's to them? like an offspring of what the establishment or uh -huh. whatever you want to say, you know, us, you know. Right, us. We're moving we're out of where we were into another place, and these people are just coming in, you know. And, you know, like now, we, I mean, we were crazy before we figured, well, if we ever get grass to be legal, it'll be out of sight, you know. And now it, it's not legal, but it's, you know, it's, it's. Now, five years ago, we were so paranoid, you know, you'd hide in your trunk, you know, and smoke grass or whatever, you know. Now it's just different. Things that, that we thought were going to be breakthroughs now are taken for granted and people are trying to get further, you know. Like, you know, it's the way it always is, I guess. But anyway, what I'm trying to say is that uh, these people like Lou Reed and David Bowie and Bowie or however you pronounce it, and uh, those, those folks are, uh, you know, I think they got something there. Uh, <laughs> okay. In that case, I'm going to ask... Take a walk on the wild side. side. <laughs> uh, the, uh, in that case, I was going to ask you a question about if you think that's the direction. There's a certain kind of uh, jazz that's coming down that's soft and pretty. Uh, you've maybe you've been listening to that. And it's mm -hmm. also, um, I've been told, and um, I've been feeling some vibrations about it, but, but you disagreed with me before when we talked about it, about country having reached a full, well, having become full grown, maybe crossing over the so called pop lines and all that kind of thing, or bluegrass, and you disagree. You still feel that way. I mean, I don't, it's only a few hours ago, of course. Yeah, but. right, right. I, 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 I feel that, uh, you know, for me anyway, country music, I mean, I love country music and I play a lot of it. I got, I got a lot of country songs that I'm still writing, you know, mm -hmm. but I don't, I don't think that, that country music is a, is a new, uh, I don't think it's a new form, you know. I think what we're doing is taking an old form and adapting it to, uh, you know, changing it, putting it, you know, our, the vibe that's happening now into country music and trying to use 1970 words and talk about things people can understand. Now, if they can get to that point without people trying to sound like they're, they're singing country music, people who, 
to, to re for country music to make it, I think you have to forget that you're singing it and, and just live it, you know. It has to be a real part. You can't be trying to use phrases that people used in the 50s because that's when country music was happening. You got to be talking about something people can relate to now and then it, and then it becomes the real, real music, you know, real country music or whatever. I think country music is like the American white blues form, you know, and that's, that's it, you know. Exactly. It and is that. It's, it's the roots, you know, and I, but uh, I, I think that it was, you know, it was really heavily gone into in the last five years, and I, I you know. You think it's been... Uh, it's well, it's been, been done, you know. Mm -hmm. It's been done. You hear a lot of steel guitars, you hear a lot of, you know, you hear a lot of everything. That's not to negate it at all. I mean, I love playing it, you know, and I will continue to play it because I, because I get off doing it. But uh, I don't think it's going to be a major force. And uh, not to me, anyway, because it's, uh, it's nothing new. Unless it's done, as you say, uh, like the Eagles style, uh, as the Eagles do it, or something like that. There's a question I wanted to uh, ask you, and th that's not true country. They're just getting a little twangy with the steel guitar. Yeah. Uh, there's a question I want to ask you. There's a, a thing that took place. You were out of, um, you weren't out. I mean, you were doing what you were doing. But uh, do you feel that the, the group America, for example, came in with a boy who sounds so much like you? To fill a void that said we need a Neil Young at this particular moment. No, I think they, I think it just came along with a good record that had a catchy tune. You know, mm. I don't think there was any. Uh, you know, I don't think. You know, I don't think. I think there's so much music out today that if they, people don't get one thing, they'll take another. You know, I mean, I don't think that. You know, I, I that that's funny saying that after what you just said. Now that I listen back to it, but I. Th I mean, I think that was a valid record, that horse with no name. I've made a lot of jokes about it to my friends and everything, and a lot of them have. To me, as a matter of fact, once I called my father up on the telephone and he told me he really dug my new record, I said, which one's that? And he said, you know, the one about the horse in the desert. You know, I said, wow, that isn't me. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's America. And he said, oh, well, it must have been another one, you know, or something like that. That was an interesting time. That was an interesting experience. But I, th I feel, you know, I feel uh, I'm not grossed out behind it at all. I feel like it's a good thing. You know, I think they were just making music that they, you know, that was reflective of their influences, you know. It was really valid. I actually got more of a buzz out of Ventura Highway than I did out of uh, Horse yeah. With No Name. So did I, actually. Yeah. Uh, the question, um, well, I'm, I'm jumping around a lot, but uh, that's okay. What about accusations like when Bill Graham quit, uh, when he gave up Fillmore East and Fillmore West, and of course went back into it again right away, practically right away. Um, Bill Graham said that um, he was tired of dealing with superstars, and uh, the the fact that they came up, well, I don't think the lines, I may be taking it out of context. But, I think uh, he did it all for the publicity. That's I think so, too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Because the question can't was, blame him, man. You know, he says that I can't stand superstars who rip me off for a lot of bread and then run away from the audience to, to, to their boats or their ranches. And of course, I right away related to, you know, to uh, was he t was he on his boat or on his ranch? <laughs> about that? I don't know, but that answers it right there. Yeah, rich musician's lifestyle. That was his riff. Mm -hmm. uh, you recently completed the, your first movie, Journey Through the Past, and uh, uh, which I haven't seen yet, as a matter of fact. Although I was well, it hasn't hasn't been out yet, but I'll yeah. get uh, when I screen it in L.A. I'll definitely invite you. I'd I'll like to see what you think of it. It's long overdone, long over, long, long overdue, long overdue, right? Long anticipated. Uh, would you like to continue making film, or would you like to? Yeah, do I really want to. I think that that's uh, you know everybody's sort of starting to get into film now, you know, and I th I really think it's a good way to go. I wish my film was already out, but you know it's coming out now. It took a long time to get it out. We had a lot of legal problems we didn't anticipate. Obviously, we put out the soundtrack album a year before the movie's coming out. The movie's only coming out in one market in Boston. It's uh, sort of an experimental picture in some ways. It's a new form. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, we're, we're going to start off where we think people will be able to relate to it, you know, college-oriented people that uh, can relate to what the film is about. It's not just a rock and roll film. I try to, to make it like an album so that you can go and see it over and over again and get something out of it every time you see it. So in that case, it doesn't have three major characters and a drama and a shooting at the end or anything like that. You know, it's a different kind of, it's a different kind of thing. Mm. I can't talk about it too much because uh, it speaks for itself. It's just a, it's a, just a vibe. 
Do you like television for you or the group? No. No? Don't like it as a medium? No. Every time I see it, I, I you know, it reminds me of Shindig or something. You're talking about in concert? I mean, I think, I think those shows are great, you know. Some people, I see people out there getting off and having a great time. Maybe someday I'll, I'll, I'll do that too, you know. But uh, I'd rather make a film and give it to them and let them show the film, you know. I'd rather make an eight minute short or something and edit it together, you know, at home in my studio and do that rather than uh, rather than make a live TV appearance because I, I, I hate to let you know let my music into the hands of people who uh, you know uh, of people who just don't understand it I, I, I purposefully I've worked with certain people through my time as a recording artist that have in my opinion made my sound better and that's what I'm basing my whole trip on and everything is the sound and the the words and the melody of my music and I can't just put it on TV with a couple of other cats who've never done it before and send it out through a four-inch speaker even though it may be reaching millions of people and everything eating TV dinners watching it you know I really don't know whether well, I don't think I need that I don't think it's for me I f feel the same way about those huge concerts and everything I did it and it was great for my head you know uh, to know that I could do that I guess that's where it, to be Quite honest, I think it was it was a good ego fulfillment for me to do that tour. But you know, even as much as I tried every night to get everybody in those barns off, I couldn't. I couldn't because I couldn't even see them, man. And I knew they couldn't see me. And I I knew that it was, you know, I had to cut off all the subtleties of my music and just project it out to 18,000 people, mm. you know. And I I was having a you know I was having a hard time doing it a lot of the time because it. My my music is basically subtle, and that's why I've gone back to just playing clubs, you know, like the Roxy. Could you repeat that? Just repeat what that's you why I've gone back to to playing clubs like the Roxy, mm -hmm. and uh, the Corral, and Topanga, and other clubs. You know, we've gotten a thing together now where we've got arrangements with certain clubs in the country that if I give them a day's notice, that they'll drop their acts that they have and, and, and that I'll just fly in and play for two or three days. Now we got that set up in three or four or five different clubs around the country, which I won't, you know. Right. But w when it happens, it'll happen. That way I can play those places. People can see me, we can have a great time. It goes down so fast, there's no scene, nobody's worried. And it gets me off. It makes me feel like I'm still a musician and not in a circus. I mean, I think some other groups like Led Zeppelin and Elton John and people like that can do it because, uh, you know, like Elton's out there with his glasses and his huge glasses and that whole trip, and I, I think that's out of sight, you know, but that's not me. And I think, uh, uh, you know, those other, those other big groups, you know, like the Allman Brothers and everything, they put forth that hard sound, man, and they're, they're I mean, they're great, the Almonds and uh, uh, Led Zeppelin and those groups. Uh, they're great for those big events, you know, but you take a guy like me and put me in those circumstances, it's just not right, man. I just don't belong there. I tried to do it. I'm not. I'm not. I know I'm not right for that. And uh, you know, it's just a different. It's a different thing. Yeah, when you were recording uh, Four Way Street and you did it at three different uh, uh, locations, I think they took the tapes and it was from three different locations. Mm -hmm. Here in L.A., I think Chicago, I think New York. Uh, I think David Crosby remarked to me. David said one time, he says, "The fabulous form is a great indoor blimp." And that was, you know, that really says it. You really cannot communicate when the people are up there in the rafters near where the lights are. Yeah, 18, unless you're playing a kind of music where you don't have that's to right. listen to the, to the words and you just listen to the feeling. And I think that's a valid thing, too. That's like, uh, you know, that's like getting together for a war dance or something and in, 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 uh, whatever it is. You know, it's a very primitive thing. It's a very primitive thing. It's, it's, it's a bunch of people with, a, with, a, with a, a bunch of things that make real loud sounds and another bunch of people that are just shaking and boogie into those loud sounds and having a great time getting drunk and taking reds and downers and ODing in the audience. I mean, let's, let's, I mean, I've been to those places. I know there's an ambulance behind the stage and those wheelchairs just fly back and forth all night, man. That's yeah. what's really happening, you know. That's where it's really at, man. It's, uh, you know, those, those things are, uh, to me, I mean, I, I went around and looked at it and it blew my mind to see that that's, that's where those things were at, and now I know that I have to play smaller, smaller halls just in order to 
give the people a fair chance to see the real person that they came to see, you know, even if as many of them don't get to, to do it. Earlier on, you said um, something about uh, the people will buy what they want to buy. Uh, they'll, they'll, they'll find the music they want, is actually what you said. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that uh, was in reference to the void about America, etc., etc. But um, in line with that, uh, there's Graham, let's get back to him for a moment, mm -hmm. who put together, or at least booked, helped book, that uh, big, big thing at Watkins Glen recently, in which 300,000 or 400,000 folk turned out for what the uh, establishment, you know, commentators like to say as a second Woodstock, or a yeah. son of Woodstock, or daughter of Woodstock. Yeah. Um, and 300,000 folk for one day. It was amazing. 400,000, whatever the figure was. It was Six, astronomical. 600,000. See, I was being conservative. Um, and that's, uh, that's astronomical. And there's the Allman Brothers, and there's... Um, the band. Uh, the band and, and, uh, and uh, Grateful Dead. The Dead, yeah. The dead. That's great that the Dead have made it to that place. I think that's fantastic. I think so, too. They've now <laughs> got their own they, label. They truly deserve it now. I've never seen a harder working unit of people than those people. Uh, they really worked hard for a long time when it, when it looked like they weren't going to be, uh, you exactly. know, really successful. They kept on at it, and they just concentrated on the quality of their sound and their vibe, you know, and, they, and uh, it's come across. I think. I'm really happy to see them where they are now. Uh, since there we, we talked about America, okay. But the Poco, Poco is a spin-off of the Springfield. Burritos were a spin-off of what? Birds, I guess. Birds, I yeah. What about the uh, spin-off groups? I mean, uh, you, you created a style with your group, the Springfield, and uh, David Crosby created a style. No one has ever done a spin-off on the Hollies, however. That's a different riff entirely. But uh, uh, is that kind of sound still Hold forth that great harmony. I mean, of course, you guys harmonize so well, but uh, that great harmony of the uh, is that disappearing off the scene. The Burrito Brothers, of course, have split up. Poco, I don't think, is any longer because Jim Messina split away to go to Loggins and Messina. Mm -hmm. uh, do you like Loggins Messina? I never have heard. I wouldn't recognize them if I heard, if I heard mm -hmm. them. I have to be honest with you. I, I I've never heard them. I don't think on record or. Uh, I don't follow it very closely. You know, I've been making this movie and everything, and I really haven't had a chance to hear them. Um, Okay, you've answered a lot of questions in the same way. Um, I want to ask you if you should just run through them again, man. I'll uh, probably give you totally right. different answers. Okay, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I don't doubt it. Stay tuned. Could you discuss Manassas as a band, Stevens Group? Uh, I don't really know them well enough to discuss them. I, I uh, yes, yeah, certain guys work with you when the when the when the four of you were together. Just Dallas. Dallas, yeah, right. Yeah. But you haven't heard them, huh? And Fuzzy, yeah. And Fuzzy, fuzzy right. That's right. I've never heard them live. No, I did. I heard them live at the Berkeley Community Theater. And, uh, you know, I was mostly watching Stephen, just because I, I didn't, you know, listening to him play the guitar. There was talk at that time, uh, about the time when you fellas split away, when you went solo, um, and uh, David and Graham teamed up, and Stephen formed Manassas, that, uh, that there was in inner turmoil or in inner tension. Uh, within, the, within the group because Stephen wanted to take the group in that direction, whereas you had your individual ideas about being intimate, as you just expressed, mm -hmm. and uh, Graham and, and, and David like to harmonize a lot against, uh, against each other. What you mean this other? last time we got together? Uh, no, the, just before this last time you got together. In other words, when Stephen formed Manassas, that's Oh, the time. yeah, right. Well, I think we just all did our own trips for a while there, and we still are, you know, we're still in totally different directions. Uh, but... Uh, I don't know. Manassas, uh, you know, Manassas, I think, is, is, uh, is, a, is a good band for Stephen, and as much as Crazy Horse was a good band for me, you know. Good. Um, do you feel that interviews such as this one, I, I, I know uh, how grateful I am that uh, we were able to get together, because uh, everybody in the media has been after you, uh, particularly the printed media, and you have never given interviews. I think you even turned down a, a Time magazine article, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? Yeah, we've turned down a couple of those, but only because uh, I can't, you know, I can't, I just can't relate to what happens when you say something and then you read it and it isn't what you said, you know, and, and the less you say, the more people take stock in what you do say. So uh, if, if it gets misinterpreted, I mean, you know, it's a pretty important thing, you know. I mean, I care what people think about what I think, you know, if they're interested, you know. Uh, it makes a difference to me. And uh, lately, I'm just starting to get loose enough where I don't care that much. I mean, where I feel that if I just go and talk and you know, just have faith, you know, that, that, you know, it'll get cut together or 
something in a way so that it represents what I was saying, you know. I figure with, in a situation like this with somebody like you, know, who I know very well enough to, you know, to communicate with and have known you for a number of years and gone through some changes with you that, that, that you know, you know me, but they're just a regular cat. It's very hard to, uh, it's very hard to get into it because I don't know where they're coming from. And I, and I don't know if they are interested in really reproducing where I'm coming from or whether they just want to get an interview with me or something to make them important make them at them. their paper and whether they even give a damn what I say, whether they make it up themselves. I mean, I've seen that happen so many times that I, you know. Do you feel that, uh, do you feel but that I, It doesn't matter. It doesn't, it doesn't matter anymore anyway. It used to matter to me, but I don't care now, whatever happens. Okay, then, uh, then you're able to, uh, this is practically my last one or two questions, maybe more like this is it. Um, are you able to really lead a, a private life? You know, you know, now that you're internationally known, I mean, can you, can you, when you go up to the ranch of Northern California, uh, able to really shut it out? Well, I, 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 you know, I don't try to shut it out anymore. I've, I've given up trying to shut it out. I got a ranch with lock gates and everything, and that shuts out a number of people who come down. But that doesn't happen any, any, uh, anymore so much because that whole thing is, seems to be ending, you know, where people would relate to your songs and come down and say, man, I know you've been singing to me for four years, and here I am. And, I, and I'm here, and uh, I, brought, I got my sleeping bag, and I, I like to stay on your ranch. Hmm. You know, and people came down like that, a lot of people like that. And I can understand it. Some of them were, you know, some of them were just plain crazy, and other ones were, were, were honestly trying to make a communicating point with me and would, you know, were hip to the fact that I, that they were invading my privacy and didn't want to put it on me for too long. You know, all different kinds of people would come down like that to my place. But now I don't. I'm not so much into it. I mean, I've been in L.A. as a matter of fact for the last month, recording and messing around. And I got a studio in the woods, you know. But I'm not there. I'm here because I I want to be with people and I want to see what people, you know, what's happening. I want to be able to reflect off what's happening because I see that that is my you know that has been my place. You know where, where, where I, I, I reflect what I see. You know, and other people feel that they may reflect the same way as I do off what they see, and they they identify with the recording, or whatever. You know, but I know that my mind has changed now from from wanting to be secluded and wanting to be alone and everything. I've I feel more outward now than I did before. I feel much happier. Something. Uh, something much freer about me now than there was before. I, I don't really know. Maybe it's my old lady and everything. Having a kid, you know, settling down a little bit. It's good for you. Oh, yeah. Real good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, uh, do you have any favorite, uh, right, I have, um, just wanted to, have any favorite cities that you like? You, you mentioned a while back that you like being able to fly into a, a place at the last moment. Any particular one you like to fly into, to work at? Um, there's a couple of them, you know, Denver, Washington, D.C., San Francisco, and uh, there's, a, there's a few. There's, there, there, there's a couple that they have got the right kind of places to play in, you know. And you like them as cities that, generally? That are cities are, are interesting to be in. I love to go to Washington. I really get charged up when I go there, walk up and down. Uh, the, that green grass thing in front of the, the Capitol, you know, and that whole thing where everything's all lined up and everything, you know. That's a pretty far out place. Mm -hmm. Just to go around there and stand around the statues, you know. Do you like the... weird. It's, a, it's actually very weird if you get really high and go and walk around there. <laughs> <laughs> That's too good. That's too good. Do you like performing as much as you like recording? Or is it equal? Or one of it's all the same to me now. Hmm. I record while I perform all the time. You know, I record live. Everything I do, I record because I feel if I, that that's how I'm going to get it. Because the people I'm singing for, I mean, I, I've, I've, I've totally given up the principle of overdubbing and everything. Did you remix and remastered your, your first album? Remember that? Yeah. Remember oh, yeah. You didn't like the way they had, they had crossed channels? They did the compatible stereo on my first album and, and blew it, man. You couldn't hear the vocal. I went crazy with those idiots. I couldn't. The guy who did that doesn't work at Warner Brothers anymore. <laughs> <laughs> those fools. My first record, they put it through this thing, man. And, uh, you know, 
The vocal disappeared, man. Neil? What time have you got? We got that's what I'm looking at. Any final words before we split? Anything? Just like to say that it's uh it's been real average. <laughs> <laughs> Has it really been? I love it a lot. <laughs> Told you it was gonna be bland. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Mitch. Right. Out of sight, man. I think that'll be real good. Thank you, Mitch. Yeah, that's why I have slow spots. Yes, it has. <laughs> mm. You're not going to edit it now, right? You no, we're not going to edit it right now. Did you hear that last one? It's been pretty average. Oh, yeah. <laughs> can, can you do this like, average? Can you do this me for a Out of sight, man. The timing is perfect. The plot was groovy. When are you going to show oh, yeah. the movie in town? It's coming. Is it? Good. Yeah, it's So when are you going to air this so we can be sure to miss it? <laughs> it's a little no. studio humor. <laughs> I know it is. Do you know when it's going to be on? Uh, yep. We're going to send it to New York by October 1st, and it should be released November 1st. I'll get you a W. Out of sight. Okay, I'd love to hear it, man. Okay. Thank you. Dude. I'm, I'm taking you over. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to pick you up. Hey, you done? I'll take your... Okay, right. What's that? Yeah. You're putting me on, Teddy. You are just looking at it. Oh, yeah. okay. sure. What was in this? I mean, but he just, this, I this, just this just taped, taped it on there. Yeah. He just taped it on there just to show me. It's just oh, a, like yeah. Where did that come from? That's the Warner Brothers uh, circular that comes out and shows the new releases. That's oh, all right. Don, thank you. I'll be back in a little while. Hey, you know, no problem. Okay. I'm just sorry I didn't want to say it. You know, it's easy. Yeah. 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 Yeah.